Today, we're going to look at uh, how the church practices joy. And I have on your notes, it's Philippians 9, 1 through 7. Well, Philippians doesn't have nine chapters. It only has four. And so uh, it's actually chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And so uh, you might want to make note of that if you're frustrated trying to find chapter number nine. Sorry. So back in the 60s, there was an Indian mystic called Mare Baba. And he often used the expression, don't worry, be happy. And any time that he corresponded with anybody in uh, the West, he would always say, don't worry, be happy. It was printed on this, uh, inspirational cards. It was, it was uh, put on inspirational posters and, and so forth during the 60s. And about 1968, Bobby McFerrin released the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And, and in fact, it was, uh, actually it was 1988 that he released it. And it was the very first a cappella song that reached number one on the Billboard charts. So uh, here's a couple of those verses. It says, here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note by note. Don't worry, be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. Oh, oh, who, who, oh, oh, who, who, oh, oh, oh. And it goes like that for a number of choruses and so forth. And then another verse said, don't worry, be happy. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry, ha, 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 ha. Ain't got no cash, ain't got no style. Ain't got no gal to make you smile. But don't worry, be happy. Because when you're worried, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. What a wonderful song. It's almost totally meaningless when you get right down to it. You see, there is a, a huge difference, a world of difference between acting happy and practicing joy. They are two different things. And we're not going to talk about being happy. We're going to talk about being joyful. How does a church practice joy? Well, I submit to you this thing, this one thing. Joy is a decision we make. It's an action that we take. And it's a reward that we receive. Let me say that again. A uh, joy is a decision we make. It's an action we take. And it's a reward that we receive. I want to challenge, encourage, and equip us to practice joy in these days. So number one, how we should see ourselves as Christ's church. Look at verse number one of Philippians chapter four. And it says this, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. You see, the Apostle Paul, this missionary Paul, uh, was talking about a pastor's cause for rejoicing. And the cause for rejoicing is the church. And so the second thing that he says there is not only is uh, the church, uh, his cause for rejoicing. It's the church is also the, the pastor, the missionaries record a reward for faithful service. Now, there's a, a vivid picture right here. It says, my joy and my crown. Now, there's uh, some vivid words to describe crown in the New Testament. There's two words, as a matter of fact, and the first one is diadema. Uh, a diadem, which uh, uh, means a royal crown, a crown of kingship. And that's not the crown that uh, uh, Paul is talking about. He's talking about the Stephanos. 
uh, that's the, the crown. Did you know that the name Stephen means one who is crowned? And uh, this is the, the kind of crown that is won. It's the crown of the victorious athlete in the Greek games. Uh, it was made of wild olive leaves interwoven with parsley and bay leaves. And of course, it, uh, it would rot away uh, very quickly. But uh, athletes would strive for this and, and to be recognized wearing the crown of victory. Paul also used it in, in Greek society whenever there was a, a, an, an awards banquet. Everyone would be given a crown, and, and it was just the same. It was uh, of these uh, olive leaves and, and so forth, and it, it described a time of festivity. So uh, this, this, uh, when Paul says, you are my crown, church, he's saying that you are my victory. You are my cause for celebration. And the reason for that was because the church was filled with Paul's beloved brethren. And, you know, we can apply that to ourselves today. The church is our cause for rejoicing. The church is our reward for faithful service. And the church is filled with our beloved brethren. And so that whenever we think about it, how we should see ourselves as a church, uh, that's a pretty good picture of, of what a church looks like to those who love the church like we do. Now, the second thing is, and this is the big one, how we should act as Christ's church. Look at the second half of verse number one, all the way through verse number six. And uh, this will, will give us specific guidelines how the church should act. And really, when you get right down to it, the church should be obedient to the will of God. Back in uh, the 11th century in Bavaria, King Henry III was tired of being king. He didn't go along with all the court life and all of the intrigue in the palace and so forth. And he decided that uh, the only way that he could get out of it was to become a monk. And so he applied at the local monastery. And uh, so the, the abbot uh, asked him when he was interviewed, uh, he said, do you know that you will have to spend the rest of your life in obedience uh, to the monastery? And the king said, I understand the rest of my life, I will be obedient to you, Abbot, as Christ leads me and Christ leads you. Then the abbot said to King Henry, he said, then I will tell you what to do. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. And he did. When he died, when King Henry died, a statement was written about him. The king learned to rule by being obedient. You know, it's pretty easy to get tired of the mundane pressures of life. The stress and pressure make us lose sight of God, what God has called us to be. And we lose track of God's will for our life. It's God's will for our life, as the Apostle Paul said in these verses, that we be obedient to the high calling that we've been called to. So the first thing he says in verse number one, second half of verse number one, he says, stand firm in the Lord. The verse actually says, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Now that word for stand firm or stand fast is stakete. Uh, it's a Greek word that was used for a soldier standing fast in the shock of battle when the enemy was surging down upon him. In Ephesians chapter 6, we find uh, the Apostle Paul again telling us about standing firm. He said in verse number 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. To stand firm, you have to put on the full armor of God. And then you have to follow God's leadership to stand firm, to keep your place. And so we find that uh, the first thing about obedience is to stand firm. A second thing that we find in verse number two, uh, the Apostle Paul dealing with a, a situation that was going on in the Philippian church. He said, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. My Greek professor in college said that uh, the first time he read that, uh, he read it as uh, he called them odious and soon touchy. And uh, really, these, these are two ladies that had gotten in a squabble about something. We don't know exactly what it was. And there have been lots of people that have tried to, to figure it out. Now, the King James Version uh, speaks of eodius and syntyche, not eodia, which is what the actual Greek says, but Eodius, which would be a male name. And so they, uh, uh, they thought about this, and there was a conjecture that Eodius and Syntyche were literally the Philippian jailer and his wife. And we don't know that to be a fact. And we, we sure don't know that the Philippian jailer and his wife had a squabble that uh, infected the whole church. But uh, we can be certain that the name is not Eodius, but it is Eodia. It's two women that uh, were involved in some sort of disagreement. And so when we put our cares in God's hand, he puts peace in our hearts. You see, rather than, than uh, giving their problem to God, these two ladies were holding on to it so that they could squabble about it. And so the second thing after standing firm in the Lord is to live in harmony in the Lord. Now notice it says, in the Lord, in the Lord, stand firm in the Lord, live in harmony in the Lord. Now, if you go through all of these six, another time it's going to say in the Lord, and so we can reasonably assume that after every one of these commands, whether it is stated uh, explicitly, but implicitly, it is in the Lord. So verse number three talks about helping each other in the Lord. Verse number three, indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There have been all kinds of suggestions uh, about who this true companion is. And uh, it's been suggested by some of the old commentators that suggested that this uh, true companion was Paul's wife. Now, we know that he, he was probably married because uh, in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, he had to be married. Now, it could have been that he uh, was widowed, but we don't know that. We don't know anything about Paul's wife other than the probability he had to be married in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin. But uh, uh, some people say, well, uh, this was Paul's wife. I don't know that that's to be true. Uh, it's suggested that uh, this uh, true companion was either the husband of Eodia or Syntyche, and uh, he was asked to step in and help his wife mend this quarrel. It could have been Lydia. Remember, Lydia was uh, the first woman that Paul encountered uh, in, Philippia, uh, in, in Philippi, and uh, it could have been Silas. It could have been Timothy. It could have been a, a, a member, Clement, the, uh, the pastor of the church, perhaps, or uh, another uh, prime candidate would be Epaphroditus, because he was the one that, that had come to Paul uh, while Paul was in prison and brought the, the financial gift to Paul 
from the Philippian church. And then he was the one that Paul assigned to go back and take this letter of thanks back to uh, the Philippian church. So it may have been uh, Epaphroditus. Uh, or it could have been Clement. We don't know anything about him. We do know that there was a, a Clement, uh, a, a bishop of Rome, uh, later in time, but we don't know. That was a common name, and so we just don't know exactly who it was. But the important thing is that we understand that Paul called upon somebody in that church uh, to help them, to help each other. And that's what we ought to be doing is helping each other in the Lord. When I was a fresh green troop out of radar tech school in Mississippi, I was transferred to a base in Arizona. And for my first uh, big job out on uh, our drone carrying C-130s, we had to replace a radar antenna that uh, uh, had a ray dome on the bottom of the C-130 skin. And it was a big thing. It was about six foot long and five foot wide. And uh, it was made out of aluminum and fiberglass and it had 430 screws in it. Well, I went out with uh, one other guy, he was my trainer and uh, he showed me how to remove the screws. And so uh, we, mostly me, uh, took out 426 of those screws. We left uh, one screw in each side. And so uh, he said to me, he said, uh, I'll be right back. And so he, uh, he left me right there on the airplane. I'd never been out on an airplane in my life. And he left me and there I was under this airplane staring up at this, this ray dome that weighed about 150 pounds and wondering if it was gonna come crashing down on me. And he left me, he got in the maintenance truck and drove away. Well, he came back in a few minutes and he had with him two other guys. And so he said to me, get on your back under the ray dome and put your feet up on the ray dome. And I did, and he did. And so there were four feet sticking up with our backs on the, the tarmac and we pushed up against that ray dome and he told uh, the other two guys, take those four screws out. So they took the four screws out and we flexed our, our legs and that ray dome came right down and those two guys pulled it off of us and we replaced the, the radar antenna. And then we came back and uh, my trainer and I got on the ground with our feet sticking up in the air. They put that ray dome back on and we pushed it right back up into its spot and they put four screws back in it. And then the four of us put the 120 or uh, the 426 screws back in. Now, that's what's called helping each other. We, there are certain things that we can't do on our own. And there are certain things that when we do them on our own, that they don't come out well. So we need each other. We need other people to help us with the work. And so help each other in the Lord. And the fourth thing is always rejoice. Verse number four says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Back in 1982, Badger Stadium in Madison, Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin fans, six, uh, 60,000 people were watching uh, Wisconsin being literally beat by Michigan State. And it seemed that it was so very odd. Every time that uh, uh, the other team would score a touchdown or, or make a, a great play or something, it just seemed like the crowds would erupt with joyful shouting and, and applause and so forth. And so uh, they were, people were wondering, what in the world are all these people rejoicing about? And then they realized that these people that were rejoicing all had a transistor radio up to their ear. For you see, at the same time that the University of Wisconsin was playing Michigan State and getting beat, the Milwaukee Brew Brewers were 
having a World Series game with the St. Louis Cardinals, the third game of the World Series, and they were winning. And so these people were not cheering for the University uh, uh, of Michigan, Michigan uh, State. They were actually cheering for the Brewers that were winning against the St. Louis Cardinals. And, you know, uh, in, our, in our situation, too, sometimes we are there in the stands watching our team getting beat, but we need to remember that there is a real game going on, and that is the heavenly game, and we are winning. We are winning that particular game. And so we have cause to rejoice, even when the rest of the world looks at us like we're crazy, we have cause to rejoice. And the fifth thing is be gentle to everyone in the Lord. Verse five, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Savior is near. You know, some of us have been accused of being blunt maybe kind of uncaring and so forth. I probably fit into that category kind of well. But you know something? I, th I think that the picture here, whenever the Apostle Paul is saying, be gentle to everyone, here's my picture of a gentle person. A gentle person is a strong, strapping even scowling, muscular man holding a tiny baby in his arms. That baby is not afraid of that big, strong, ugly man. That baby sees the love in his eyes and the gentleness that's there. That's the picture. And so we need to be treating each other as that strong man treats a baby. That's how we should treat each other. That's what Paul is saying. Be gentle to everyone in the Lord. And number six, be anxious for nothing in the Lord. It says be anxious for nothing. The word for worry in the Greek language is meri manyo. It means to be drawn out in different directions. Be anxious for nothing. E. Stanley Jones once said that worry is the interest we pay on tomorrow's troubles. When we become so preoccupied with the future troubles that our present thoughts are troubled, we are really in trouble. Gordon McDonald said, no man ever sank under the burden of the day. It's when tomorrow's burdens are added to the burdens of today that the weight is more than any man can bear. Douglas Rumford uh, cites a study that explains why we shouldn't uh, uh, let fear rule our lives. He said that uh, a study shows that 60% of our fears are totally unfounded. They're figments of our imagination. 20% of the reasons we fear are already behind us. They can't hurt us anymore. 10% are so petty that they don't make a difference anyway. 5% are real, but we can't do anything about them. That means only 5% of the worries that we have uh, are things that we can actually do something about. That's it. So stop the anxiety. Be anxious for nothing in the Lord. Worry is merely unbelief parading in disguise. Ian McLaren claimed that, uh, uh, what does your uh, anxiety do? It does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it does empty today of its strength. It does not make you escape evil. It makes you unfit to cope with it when it comes. God gives us the power to bear all the sorrow of his making, but he does not guarantee to give us strength to bear the burdens of our own making, such as worry induces. Be anxious for nothing. And the seventh thing, 
pray to the Father in the Lord. Verse number six, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Phillips translation of, of this verse says, when you pray, tell God every detail of your needs. It's big enough. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Everything is worthy of our prayers. We need to believe that prayer can actually make a difference. And so I heard a story about General Patton in World War II. Uh, they were, the Third Army was driving the, the Nazis back and, and they, were, were, they were literally pushing them back miles and miles and miles uh, every time. And uh, they were confronted with fog and rain. And of course, uh, you know, for an infantry uh, like this, uh, uh, rain would, uh, would really stop them in their tracks. And so Patton immediately called a chaplain and uh, uh, said, do you have a good prayer about the weather? And immediately the chaplain said, no, but I'll write one. And so he wrote a prayer and gave it to Patton and Patton ordered it to be printed and distributed to the 250,000 soldiers under his command, directing them to pray for clear weather. You know, if Patton could give that to 250,000 soldiers, we ought, to be, we ought to be encouraging each other to pray for the needs that we have. The scriptures definitely teach us that God wants us to bring our requests directly to him. We can be confident that he cares and that he will answer, but he's never obligated to answer in the way that we want or just because many people are praying. So pray. Pray to the Father in the Lord. You know, prayer is a conversation. It's not a formula, but sometimes we, we can use a method to freshen up our prayer life, our prayer time. We can pray the Psalms or other scriptures like the Lord's Prayer. You can pray the Lord's Prayer. And just because you're reading a prayer out of the scripture, it doesn't mean that it's not good and true and genuine and God hears it and will answer. It is definitely worth doing so pray the psalms you can you can take the the psalms and go through them one one psalm per day uh you can go through the psalms in in uh uh five months just taking one psalm a day and you can pray what it talks about in that psalm or you can use a, a thing like acts Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's always uh, a good thing to have a well-rounded prayer uh, and uh, so forth. But I recently came upon a thing that uh, uh, was a five-finger prayer. So you can uh, uh, fold your hand. When you, when you fold your hand up, your thumb is, is closest to you. And, uh, and so uh, you can think... Uh, when you use that guide and the thumb is nearest to you, that you ought to, to, to begin praying for those of your loved ones that are closest to you. Now, your index finger is, is a pointer. And so somebody is still on. Would you uh, mute yourself, please? And uh, uh, would you... Uh, uh, back to it, uh, the, the index finger is the pointer. Uh, pray for those who teach, Bible teachers, preachers, and those who teach children especially. And the next finger is the tallest finger. It reminds you to pray for those in authority over you, national, local leaders, and uh, uh, anybody that, that is in charge of people. The fourth finger is, is literally uh, the weakest finger. Pray for those who are in trouble or those who are suffering. And then it comes to the little finger that reminds you of your smallness in relation 
to God's greatness. Ask him to supply all of your needs. Whatever method you use, just talk to your father. He wants to hear what's on your heart. Now, those are the seven activities, the seven things that we can do, seven practices that will help us be obedient to God, not just as individuals, but also as a whole church. Now, the, the last part, what will we experience as Christ church when we recognize that we can celebrate what he has done for us through the church, when we are obedient to what he asked the church to do, what will we experience? Verse number seven, we will experience the peace of God that passes all comprehension. Uh, one translation says, surpasses all understanding. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, uh, there's a number of scriptures that talk about the fact that we'll get peace, we'll, we'll experience peace uh, through our, our God and Savior. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 uh, says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Love, joy, peace. Peace. Romans 5.1, therefore, having ju been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. John 16.33, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And then in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. We have his peace, his peace, and it's different from the world's kind of peace. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, one of my favorite verses in all the scriptures, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. First Peter, or 2 Peter 2, uh, 1, 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, experiencing peace is really a privilege and a joy. You know, the peacekeeper in the Old West was a gun. It was a model 1873 Colt revolver single action. But you know what? The peacemaker today is a church full of joyous believers. A joyous church brings more peace than all of the six shooters of the Old West. The second thing, after we experience the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension, the second thing is our hearts and minds will be protected in Christ Jesus. Look what it says in the last part of verse 7. We'll guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. I was reminded when I read this verse of Psalm 23, verse number four, where the psalmist said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, whenever we talk about our hearts and minds being protected, the rod and staff of the shepherd are a perfect example of the way the Holy Spirit protects us. With the staff, the shepherd would direct the sheep where to go. If one of them would start to drift off, he would just place the staff up against his side and begin to push it in the right direction. And the rod 
was there for protection against the enemies, the bears and the wolves and the lions that infested the shepherd's environment. And so it is with our Holy Spirit. He will beat back all of the demonic opposition and he will guide us and lead us to the green pastures and the still waters. That's what we as a church can expect, what we will experience in Christ's church. Speaking of joy, I remember years ago, 1978 to be exact, I had just graduated from college and I was pastor of a church there in Phoenix. And I got an invitation to go to the Billy Graham School of Evangelism before his 1978 crusade in Las Vegas. And it was a time for pastors and their, their wives to um, get some really wonderful encouragement and evangelistic training. And I remember that we were sitting in a worship service in, in a large church uh, in Las Vegas. And I was sitting uh, closest to the aisle, and there were so many people coming in that they had to put more chairs in. And I remember that uh, uh, we uh, uh, recognized people coming in, and one of the one of the the singers at the crusade, Evie Tornquist, uh, came and and was going to sit in one of the folding chairs, and I I got up, and and showed her sit right down uh, beside my wife. And I took the folding chair and there was another folding chair on my right. And all of a sudden Cliff Barrows comes and sits down, shakes hands with me. And I thought, man, this guy is just so full of joy. I can hardly stand it. And then George Beverly Shea got up and sang these words. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me and the fairest of 10,000. In my blessed Lord, I see. Love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree. Mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. Every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see. On his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. By the crystal flowing river, with the ransomed I will sing. And forever and forever, praise and glorify the king. What a wonderful experience it was to hear him. I glanced to my right and Cliff Barrows was sitting there with the biggest smile on his face that you've ever seen and tears out of both eyes dripping down on his chin. That's the kind of joy that we as the church have in Jesus Christ, our Lord, the fairest of 10,000. He is an all in all to me.